Today, we're going to talk about conformal symmetry. Conformal symmetry is a fundamental notion in conformal field theory, which is one of the most active fields of theoretical physics today. One experimental use is in modelling many body systems at the critical point when they're between phases of matter. Probably the most famous appearance of conformal field theory, or CFT, is as the latter half of the ADS CFT correspondence proposed by Maldacena. This correspondence is so celebrated as it models both quantum and gravitational effects, and a theory of quantum gravity is one of the main goals of modern theoretical physics. Another application of CFT is string theory, and string theory is also where many of the ideas in conformal field theory originated. While string theory may no longer be a popular theory for modelling our universe, the study of string theory and CFT introduced structures which drove breakthroughs in mathematics. So what is conformal field theory? In brief, it's a theory, a physical theory, which has conformal symmetry. You should view this as an extension of the fact that the laws of physics largely don't depend on where you are, what time it is, and which direction you're facing. Restated, the laws of physics have space translational symmetry, time translational symmetry, and rotational symmetry. So what are the transformations that a conformally symmetric system is invariant under? also known as the conformal transformations. You'll get slightly different answers depending on who you ask. A mathematician would say something like an angle preserving transformation, while a physicist might be more likely to say a symmetry of a scale invariant system. Actually, scale invariant systems are quite a strange thing to consider. Consider Alice, who is a scale invariant girl living in a scale invariant world. By virtue of being scale invariant, Alice can scale up by a factor of two, and she shouldn't experience anything differently. Now let's think about the stress exerted on her shins. The equation for stress is force divided by area. In this case, the area is the cross-sectional area of her shins, while the force is her own body weight, which is proportional to her volume. We can find how these scale with some characteristic length scale L of Alice, such as her height. Her volume will scale as L cubed, while the cross-sectional area scales as L squared. So the stress exerted on her shins scales proportional to her own length scale, which is going to be pretty painful as Alice grows large. The only way Alice can escape this is if she is in fact massless with zero density, which feels like an unfair body standard to hold Alice to. So even everyday macroscopic physics is scale dependent. So we're going to talk about conformal transformations as angle-preserving transformations, and see how scale invariance comes out of that. And we'll start with the simplest case, angle-preserving transformations in two dimensions. We can't just use one dimension because there's no angles. And the nice thing is, all the transformations that you learn as a baby preserve angles. Translations, nice. Rotations, nice. Dilatations, nice, we'll take that. The rotation and dilatation here were centered at the angle, but in fact you can rotate or dilate about any point and you still get an angle preserving symmetry. And by the way, dilatations are just a fancy word for enlargement, but make it more clear that shrinking is allowed as well. At this point, you might be wondering what transformations don't preserve angles, so you graduate from kindergarten and start thinking about skew or shear transformations. For this particular shear, the unit vector in the x direction and the unit vector in the y direction start out at a right angle, but end up at pi on 4 radians apart. There are lots of funky transformations which are also not angle-preserving, and in fact the vast majority of 2D transformations do not preserve angles. Pretty remarkably, one can show that those transformations from earlier, translation, rotation, and dilatation, as well as their combinations, are the only conformal transformations of the whole plane. That is, the only invertible transformations from the plane to itself that preserve angles. You might be wondering why reflections are excluded, since they look like they preserve angles, but they only preserve angle magnitude, but they flip the direction of the angle.
Within this group of transformations generated by translations, rotations, and dilatations, we can restrict only some of these transformations to find other, perhaps more familiar, transformation groups. For example, restricting to translations and rotations only, then the transformations don't just preserve angles, but also preserve lengths. And these transformations are called isometries. Dilatation obviously doesn't preserve length, and that's the real novelty of conformal symmetry. Just to emphasize this point, if rescaling is a symmetry of your system, then equivalently, the system has to be scale invariant. If we instead restrict the rotations and dilatations about the origin, we get linear transformations, which can be described by matrices. However, translation is not a linear map, so we can't describe it by a matrix. Surprisingly, if the symmetries are extended by some extra transformations, called special conformal transformations, then the set of transformations generated by rotation, dilatation, translation, and these new special conformal transformations turns out to be the symmetries of space-time, with three space and one time dimension, and these can be described by matrices. Okay, but I said earlier that the transformations without these new special ones are all the conformal transformations of the plane. So these extra symmetries turn out to come from what's called a conformal extension of the plane. The rest of this video is going to be about why and how we can do this extension and the extra structure this extension buys us. The way that we extend the plane is by adding a single new point to get a sphere. We can see how this works by folding up a disc. By increasing the radius of the disc, the gap in the sphere closes up, so that in the limit that the radius goes to infinity, we get the plane, and then only a single point is needed to plug up the gap. This new point is sometimes referred to as the point at infinity. But why should we be allowed to add this point? I mean, one of the most disturbing things about it is that on the plane, it would be infinitely far away from all the other points. But then, if rescaling is a genuine symmetry of the theory, then lengths are not a meaningful quantity. So it's not a problem that the point at infinity is infinitely far away from any point on the plane. But angles should be a meaningful quantity, and so we do need to check angles are preserved when we do this conformal extension. And that requires us to 1. be a bit more precise about how we do the extension, and 2. define what we mean by angles on a sphere. Let's tackle the second question first. It turns out what we want to do is to define the angle between two curves. The reason is then we can talk about curves on a sphere. And since we view the sphere as being in 3D space, then these are just curves in 3D space. Then what's the angle between two curves? Well, we're familiar with the angle between vectors, so what we want to do is to get vectors from the curves, at least at the point where the two curves meet. This is given by the tangent vectors, and then the angle at the meeting point is the angle between these tangent vectors. And this also works for curves in 3D, and in particular, curves on a sphere. Now that we've established what angles are on a sphere, we want to return to the earlier question of how this compactification occurs. In other words, we want a way to map the sphere onto the plane, and vice versa, in a way that these angles are preserved. There is a well-known map which does this, called stereographic projection. We can look at how the projection works in a lower dimensional case, which instead gives a mapping from the circle to the line instead of the sphere to the plane. But the mapping from the sphere to the plane works similarly. The way it works is that for every point on the circle, except for the North Pole, a line can be drawn going through the North Pole and the chosen point. This line also hits the x-axis in a unique position. Sending every point on the circle to its corresponding point on the line defines this stereographic projection map. And with some elementary geometry, you can show this formula for the image of a point on the circle.
Back to 2D stereographic projection. To show angles are preserved, what you'd need to check is that for every angle on the sphere, given by a pair of crossing curves, that if those curves are then mapped onto the plane by stereographic projection, then the angle remains the same. And if you manage to check that, then that completes the proof that the sphere is a conformal extension of the plane, i.e. it is an extension that preserves angles. Good, we have our extended plane. Now the point of us doing this extension was to look at the extra symmetry that the extension buys us. So let's look at the original transformations on the plane, rotation, dilatation, and translation, and see how they extend to transformations of the sphere. The most straightforward to understand is the rotation of the plane. Inverting the stereographic projection, the analogous transformation on the sphere is also a rotation. Now let's look at dilatation of the plane. On the sphere, it sort of squeezes the points of the sphere towards the North Pole. I've talked about this transformation on the sphere a few times in previous videos, and this is where we make contact with the earlier mention of spacetime, as this corresponds to a relativistic effect due to accelerating upwards, which in relativity is called a boost. Finally, let's look at translation. This is probably the weirdest one on the sphere. It squeezes the points to the right from this point of view, starting from the left of the North Pole, but while keeping the North Pole fixed. A larger translation would in fact start squeezing the points to the right and then up back towards the North Pole. Notice that for all of these, the North Pole is actually a fixed point. And this is a manifestation of the fact that the North Pole represents the point at infinity, which isn't part of the plane. So any proper transformations of the plane must fix infinity. But now that we're on the sphere, the point at infinity loses its privileged status, and we need to treat the points more democratically. In particular, we can do this translation on the sphere, but with the sphere flipped upside down. And this transformation definitely doesn't preserve the point at infinity. In fact, this transformation is precisely the special conformal transformation. In physics, these four transformations, rotation, dilatation, translations, and special conformal transformations, generate all the conformal transformations. And in fact, this process we did works for any number of dimensions, or even any number of space and time dimensions, if we talk about the conformal symmetries of space-time. Let's recap what we did. The conformal transformations of the plane are only rotation, dilatation, and translation. But since we only care about angles and not distances, we obtained a more symmetric space from the plane, called its conformal extension, which turned out to be a sphere. The sphere came from adding just a single point at infinity, and the original conformal transformations are those which preserve the point at infinity. But the sphere has additional symmetries, which need not preserve the point at infinity, in particular these special conformal transformations. The consequences of this will be explored more next time, but for now, thanks for watching. If you found this interesting, leave a like if you'd like, or subscribe, it helps me out, and if you have any questions or comments, leave them down below. See you next time.